I was panicked. Let me tell you what I was doing last night. Refreshing Wayne County over and over again before I went on TV. <laughs> Refreshing. Because I was worried it was going to be like 50%. Based on everything I'd heard, I hadn't been to Wayne County. I hadn't been to Dearborn. I hadn't been to Michigan. I was basing this all on the media consumption. I was worried that Joe Biden was going to lose. He did not lose the county. He did not lose the city. And so, like, okay, still, there still could be concerns. We need every vote. But, like, everybody's got to calm down. Hello, everyone. This is JVL here with my best friends, Sarah Longwell and Tim Miller of The Bulwark, fresh off of seeing each other in person, live, out of the house, in public, and now I'm sick because of it. <sighs> Never leave great. your house. I, I'm That's great. good. I that feel I awesome. Sick. I feel and awesome. How, I've got a big you, week coming up. Dinners, you, dates, bars, concerts. Tim, mm. you were not at this big conference uh, mm. because I'm sorry that your grandmother died. Um, uh, genuinely sorry. I don't Thank know you. if that's no. cutting off as not No, 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 no. it comes off as genuine uh, and I appreciate okay. that. It came off as ingenuine because it's like, were you really sorry that I missed it? Or well, <laughs> that no, part I, of it I'm maybe I'm genuinely was a joke. sorry that your grandmother died. However, yeah. what you missed was JVL attending this conference and still managing to touch zero people. Like the fact that he's sick and I'm not, because I hung out and put my arms around people and took selfies and shook hands. And JVL literally went through like the back of the kitchen to avoid seeing another human. Uh, and so you and know it what, didn't JVL? work. This is why you don't have antibodies. The germs JVL. found me. Yeah, that's, that's right. why you don't have antibodies. You didn't make out with enough people in college. In you, just, yeah. you didn't lick any as many faces yeah, as well, Tim. That's, mm -mm. that's needed. All right, so Michigan. Evolutionary. We had a Michigan primary, a big, huge, momentous primary last night. And the, the big news is that Donald Trump dominated and that Joe Biden was once again exposed as being incredibly weak and it's such a danger and everybody is so concerned about all of the... Un I said you guys are going to have to carry the show today, but I am kind of worked up over this. Uh, would one of you like to blow this up for me so I don't have to... I am resistance-pilled on this. I don't know where Sarah is, but uh, I'm happy to do the... <laughs> The resistance pill take, and then Sarah maybe can do a, a more, you know, a more even hand. Oh, I don't know what her opinion is, so maybe we can all just agree. Who knows? I'll give you mine now first, which is that uh, okay, there's. I think that when the threat on the other side is potentially the end of democracy, it's always okay to be worried about everything. Okay, it's always okay to be worried about everything. Fair. And so it's fine if people want to be worried about the Muslim vote in Dearborn or the kids in Ann Arbor. But I, I just want to tell you something. The Wayne County vote, all right, the uncommitted vote was 17%. 17% went uncommitted. Not, I, I'd love it if it was 0.7, okay? I would love it if Donald Trump was losing by 70. But it was 17%. The I, I can't say the name of the county where Ann Arbor is, but the You're county where just in Wayne County, just in Wayne County, because it, it was, wasn't seventeen. It was thirteen overall. statewide. It was thirteen statewide. Yeah. Okay, good. it was also good. seventeen in Ann Arbor. So these are the peak areas to be worried about, like Wayne County, Ann Arbor, seventeen percent. That's where the privileged white kids are, and where the Muslims are, with concerns about Joe Biden's Gaza policy. Okay, um, I want to take you back to a time in 2016. There was another hopeless protest vote. That happened back then. It was by a gentleman named John Kasich. John Kasich had no chance to win. There was no, it was not like he had a lot of money and campaigning. Frankly, the uncommitted people probably had more resources and effort organizing in Michigan than John Kasich did. John Kasich in Wayne County, 27%. Ooh. 27% against Donald Trump that year. Donald Trump wins Michigan. Um, I just, I don't remember. See panels of nine people on CNN saying, boy, I, we need to learn more about these John Kasich voters. Like, they want consensus. You know, they want their politicians to be kind to one another. They want compromise. That could be trouble for Donald Trump. Should we learn more about their motivations? Can we profile a couple of them? Can we get a couple of compromise advocates and, and write a big feature article on them and talk to their local leaders? Is there a city council member that voted for John Kasich that we can put on TV? I don't remember any of that because it was like, okay, it was fine. It was like, nice job, John Kasich. Pat on the head. You got low 20s. You know, it was about 10% statewide. Too. I think it was 13, 23. You got low 20s. That's not anything. You can't win this primary. And so... I just, the contextualizing around this, I think, has just been totally missed. Um, you know, even our friends at Drudge, 
you know, Drudge, I was on Drudge this morning, it's like, way exceed expectations. You know, the Times headline, the Post headline, everybody's like, problems for Biden. And I'm like, did they exceed expectations? I, they, I, to, they actually didn't meet my expectations. I was panicked. Let me tell you what I was doing last night. Refreshing Wayne County over and over again before <laughs> I went on TV. Refreshing. Because I was worried it was going to be like 50%. Based on everything I'd heard, I hadn't been to Wayne County. I hadn't been to Dearborn. I hadn't been to Michigan. I was basing this all on the media consumption. I was worried that Joe Biden was going to lose Dearborn. He did not. He so did not statewide. lose the county. He did not lose the city. And so, like, okay, still, there still could be concerns. We need every vote. But, like, me, everybody's got to calm down. One more, let me give you one more piece of context before I throw to you, Sarah. Uh, statewide, 13% of the Democratic electorate went uncommitted. In 2012, when Barack Obama faced nothing, 11% of the vote in Michigan went uncommitted. So this is, I mean, we're just in line with, do people not remember that Barack Obama, there were a handful of states in which he finished in the mid 50s, in the mid 50s in 2012. So people were mad about drones and stuff. Yeah. And there was right? also that there was also the center right, like the Obama Trump voters hadn't, you know. So like it was right. like in West Virginia, he almost lost to a guy that was like in jail and was like a proto MAGA. Yeah, Randall Terry took eighteen percent of the vote in Oklahoma. Right, the anti-abortion Deep activists. Ball. This is the point. Is I, anyway, Sarah, what do you think? Because I look at this and I feel like the media. I hate becoming a media criticism person because, Sorry. and also I agree, John. Joe Biden is weak. Joe Biden has worries. But what's happened is they have taken the idea that Joe Biden is weak, which comes entirely from his head-to-head -head polling with, with Trump, and decided that that's the lens through which they will view every single outcome. And it's driving me insane. Uh, here's my... I want to talk about the Republican side of, of Michigan. Uh, okay. But on the because Democratic side... Okay. I, I, I do mostly agree with you. Here's the thing I'll say about uh, this 13%. Okay, so Rashida Tlaib's sister was out there whipping votes for this. Like, there was a concerted, like, with JVL, when you talk Beto. about it being in line, Beto, like, and uh, go, Beto, you've never won anything, all right? I'm sorry. I know you guys all loved him. <laughs> JVL once called him raw political horse flesh or whatever weird concoction JVL comes up with. So gross. So gross. And, like, you know what? Go away, Beto. Uh, you're done. Your moment's over. Anyway, here's the thing. Sometimes it is good for people to get things out of their system, right? Sometimes people need a way to say, I'm mad. And uh, I actually think going and having a protest vote uh, in a primary where it doesn't matter and where, uh, and this is a side note, but also part of the main point, in which there is a candidate who is exactly the person everyone says Joe Biden needs to be replaced with, which is a young, moderate, just political machine known as Dean Phillips, who came in fourth, losing to both uncommitted and Marianne Williamson, who dropped out, I don't three know, weeks three ago. weeks ago. And we got back ago. in this morning. She was so encouraged by her third place finish, <laughs> she unsuspended. Welcome back to the race, Marianne. I didn't Marianne. know that. Yeah, Good it happened for an her. hour Good or two for ago. Her. Yeah, why shouldn't she? Why shouldn't she get back in? Dean Phillips has, I'm sorry, but if there is not something out there more dispositive of the notion that there's just like an overwhelming appetite for an alternative to Joe Biden, like it's right there and nobody seems to want it. So, okay, that's all. Like, good. I'm glad. I'm glad people had a, a an electoral way to organize, express their displeasure, and uh, at, a, at a moment when the stakes are non-existent, other than and this is what's annoying, right? The reason you're complaining about the media is there are no stakes beyond narrative. And so to have uh, them be able to get this, like, that's their win, right? What they want is to be able to see, like, see, like, we matter. And we are going to take him down if he doesn't change. And for me, I think if, look, if the election were tomorrow, if I thought the election were in three weeks, I would be deeply panicked. But it is not. And the conditions are going to change in a variety of ways between now and then. And I don't know if you guys saw old Uncle Joe with his ice cream cone telling us that he thinks we're going to get the ceasefire. We can talk about the optics of that. But the, but the point is, I, he could have chosen a different moment to give us important news. Or like maybe I wouldn't have like, tried to take a bite first. That was the optics <laughs> of the thing for me. Like He, uh, he like opens his mouth to take a bite, and then he and it's like, just give your answer and then lick. 
I'm that anti-cone. That would be my one piece of feedback. All civilized people take their ice cream in a cup. I, Cones I, are barbaric. I'm I just think, that listen, idea. if you're going to make news, like if you're going to you're going to say something very presidential, like we're working, we're going to enter a negotiate or like we're going to we're winning our negotiations on a ceasefire. Like we're getting there. There's going to be a ceasefire. Get behind a podium, man. Like those are your big moments. Don't don't have an ice cream cone in your hand. It's it's not somebody was uh, there was I don't know that Clay Travis tweet about how, you know, grown right. men, you know, like what it's so stupid. I, he can have ice cream. I just don't think he should like announce Big foreign policy stuff while he's eating ice cream. Or on the driving range. Or whatever, yeah. Uh, so, uh, anyway, my point is, I hope everybody feels a little better. Hope you got it out of your system. And now you can get back to the serious grown-up business, uh, eventually, of, of defeating Donald Trump. All right, so talk and by the way, before you get to the Republicans, can Sarah. I just make a pitch for the bulwark? If you are listening to this, because I, I also don't like media criticism. I hate. I don't care. There's a lot of media outlets. This is why I don't like media. This is why I hate the the people who are media obsessed critics. It's like, it's like I don't care. It's 2024. There are a million media outlets. One of them is right here. We'll tell you what we really think. Wasn't really that big of a deal last night. The uncommitted thing. Also, Joe Biden shouldn't eat ice cream and announce Israel. So you know, tell your pals if they're just looking for real talk and they don't want nine person panels analyzing the Dearborn City Council. This is a great place for them. This is good. This is. We don't need a yeah. media critic. It's right here. Mm. Okay, agree. Republican side. Yeah. Okay, so Tim and I were texting about this or slacking or something. Here's the reason I thought that Michigan was pretty important. So both in New Hampshire and in South Carolina, they were not just open primaries, because actually Michigan is too, uh, but they were open primaries that had long lead-up times. So Nikki Haley spent, I believe, $16 million in South Carolina, uh, and she spent... 500,000 in Michigan, right? And so what we were going to get is a much and so so they had time in New Hampshire and in South Carolina to really like gin up the kind of anti-Trump coalition. A lot of independents turned out that it's unclear that they were people who would have voted in a Republican primary if they had something better to do. But they like wanted to go out there and cast a vote against Trump. So uh, Michigan was going to be a much purer uh, you know, unengineered um, unorganized test of Nikki Haley with the party. It's interesting to me is so she got twenty eight percent. Okay, she got twenty eight percent. We're down to twenty seven actually since she's down. But, th- but that's fine. That's fine. So, but this is the reason that that number was interesting to me is that if you go back to South Carolina and do you look at not the full total. So everybody is saying forty percent of Republicans voted against Donald Trump in the South Carolina primary. That's wrong. Because there were tons and tons of independents that I'm not sure are even right-leaning independents counted in those numbers. If you looked at self-identified Republicans who voted for Nikki Haley in South Carolina, it was 28%. And so to me, I think we are getting closer to a pretty realistic picture. And to me, this is one of the reasons it jumps out at me is that there's a number I've been kind of living by in my persuasion work, which is if 70% of the Republican Party believes the election was stolen, that means that there's 30 percent that doesn't. And as JBL noted in his triad, which I read, she puts up Saddam Hussein type numbers among voters who do not believe Republican voters who do not believe the election was stolen. And so that is an incredibly important persuasion constituency, including and also if you go back to JVL's focus group podcast that he did with me, one of the things that's notable about two time Trump voters who don't want to vote for him again is it is about his election denialism, which led to January 6th, which was after they voted for him again in 2020. Right. Then they saw that. That's one of the reasons that they're out. So that number, that 28%, I think that's our universe. That's what we're working with. And for me, what's, uh, I think, a little bit exciting about that, the reason I get got kind of pumped about this is, you know, Donald Trump is telling people, forget what Nikki Haley's saying about Trump. Think about what Trump's saying to Nikki Haley voters. When we were at this uh, conference this weekend, a lot of uh, T-shirts that said, permanently barred. Because Donald Trump is telling those people he doesn't want them in the coalition. And that's true. Nikki Haley also said today, I think the party may have changed away from, uh, what did she say? I can't remember her exact Oh, you think quote. so, doctor. Yeah, that's right. But it's wow. like, it's like, wait, look, it's all coming together. Things are starting to, people are starting to understand that this 30% actually no longer belongs in the same coalition with Donald Trump and his voters who all think the election was stolen, who are steeped in grievance. And this 28% 
Those are the big margin makers. That is a decent number. That's not 9%. That's not 6%. Okay, that's a big percentage, and I like it. I like to see it. So anyway, I felt good about Michigan last night, and I'm interested in what you guys think. Well, I didn't feel quite as good as you, but um, that's nice. I like that kind of. That's you're sort of you're sort of trying to get me ginned up a little bit here. Um, I, I basically I, I basically identified the same observation as you, but through a negative lens, which I think is te- which I think is telling, right? <laughs> um, but which is like we we confirmed something that all of us basically knew, but we hadn't yet been able to confirm, which is that. Like a big percentage of Nikki's New Hampshire and South Carolina vote was people that are not that, that were not Republicans, and yeah. they, they're they're part of this other group. Some of them are Red Dog Democrats. Some of them are Never Trumpers. Some of them are people. Some of them are libs who are high, who hate Donald Trump so much that they had nothing better to do on a Tuesday than to go and vote for Nikki Haley, right? Because they um you know just are doing anything possible. And good on you, all those people that went and did that. Um, uh, as compared to Beto, good on those people, bad on Beto. Um, as far as you know, what your what your response is to Donald Trump if you're if you're from the left. So, I, I think that it confirmed that the group isn't as big as some people hoped. You know, I, I can kind of confirm for me that it's about what we think, right? Which is yeah. you know, which is that it's not even a third. It's not like you're really squeezing it if you're going to call it a third. Maybe it's a third of Massachusetts, but it's a, not a third in most places. And once we get down south, it's going to get even lower than twenty eight, right? But south, the south doesn't really, except for Georgia, the south doesn't really matter. That's right. Um, this is Michigan. This right. is Michigan, right? Yeah, this is Michigan. not Arkansas. This yeah. isn't uh, right. So, exactly. So yeah. it's a swing state. So I, I I share your encouragement about that. I share JBL's encouragement. I think that the that my big takeaway, which is similar to what you're talking about, about that group that believes the um, election was legit in 2020, it's the same group, as JVL has pointed out, that think the economy is either okay or good or excellent. Nikki Haley is winning with those people. To me, what that says is that those people that voted against Trump are at least reachable, right? Like that there is a group of people that's more than a quarter, less than a third, that, that is at least getting news from someplace besides Facebook and Newsmax and Tucker Carlson and Fox, right? Yeah. And so that doesn't mean that they're going to vote for Joe Biden. No, it I'm not saying that, you know, but that means that they can be messaged to. And so yes. that gives us our challenge, right? So from March to November, it's like these people are going to hear the message, whatever, whatever contrast message Joe Biden wants to deliver, um, whatever contrast message... Um, Sarah's efforts, you know, on the ac- activism side and persuasion side, want to deliver, et-, et-, et cetera. And so I think that, you know, is is now like, our like kind of our known known, you know. And we learn that, and it'll be really confirmed next Tuesday, uh, you know, when we'll be able to just kind of see the differences in different types of states and different types of demographics on Super Tuesday. Um, but I, you know, I think that that was a, a noteworthy lesson last night. Real quick before we leave Michigan. Uh, Nobody seems to want to talk about this, but the Michigan State Republican Party, kind of a mess. Uh, Michigan kind State Republicans are the the crazy people who marched on the Capitol with long guns and had a bunch of guys arrested for coming up with an idea of kidnapping the governor. And then they had this, this ultra MAGA crazy, Christina Caramo, who was, you know, made head of the party. She won the election to be head of the state party. Things got so bad that they voted her out, and she she basically just declined to be thrown out and kept insisting that she was, in fact, still the head of the state Do you know the, the best party. part of the story? Do you know the date of when they voted to throw her out, when she refused to accept it? Uh, was it the Ides of March? January 6th. January 6th. Yeah. <laughs> January 6th. <laughs> <laughs> she had a Michigan State Republican Party insurrection three years That's after amazing. the actual one to the date. Do you also know that Christina Caramo ran for Secretary of State in Michigan and that had she right. won, had Would Gretchen been... Whitmer not put up this 10 yeah. point. Like and she, uh, like so, she would have been running the election, which is what they wanted. She was one of the big election deniers who ran for Secretary of State in 2022. Uh, she got blown out, and now the party has figured out they need to get rid of her. Unlike the Arizona Republican Party, which just gets crazier and crazier. I don't know. I mean, well, hoax yesterday, yeah, hoax was finally not that. found against her. No, she's not. So yeah, yesterday the court in Michigan finally said, "No, you're you're not get get out." You're not the head of the Republican Party. And so she's out in the Michigan. But isn't this, again, I mean, I understand what all the polls say. Uh, 
But between the fact of having a very popular Democratic governor in place in Michigan and the state party's organization being an utter clusterfuck, uh, again, I just it makes me feel a little bit better about Biden's chances. Yeah, in I think state. that this matters more in lower to, in lower races, but I do think it's interesting, and I think that kind of a side story. You know, which uh, you know, sort of, uh, she wrote about with regards to the Iowa Se- Ohio Senate race. This kind of MAGA eating itself story is something real and worth watching. And I was, ta- I, I kind of didn't realize, you know, so Tudor Dixon, who ran against Gretchen mm. Whitmer, she has been. Um, uh, uh, she, the scales are falling from her eyes a little bit as well. Uh, she, really? She's vo- she's for Trump. She's for Trump, but she has been part of this criticizing Karamo, criticizing about how MAGA is not taking this serious, you know, like criticizing some of the election denialism. Uh, I, I think, I don't want to overstate it, but I think kind of betrayed that maybe she, you know, didn't feel like she was fully candid about her views about the 2020 election during the mm. midterms and, and is doing a little bit of a mea culpa on that side. But, you know, still, she's still, she is not, not she's not Liz Cheneying, but I think it's interesting. Right, to see that. Like when you see somebody like Tudor Dixon in a state like Michigan being like, guys, things are bad. Like we actually have to change course here. We're turning people off. We're, you know, we're not being truthful. Like this is, I, I think that if, you know, that it's different if, you know, a Pete Meyer or a Ken, you know, somebody that's a moderate out there is doing that. To have a Tudor Dixon doing that, I think is, you know, noteworthy that she sees problems under the hood. Yeah. All right, moving on. Joe Biden. Wait, oh, I'm sorry. Do you have something to answer? Well, the only thing I want to – and maybe, maybe we can do it in this Joe Biden segment. But I, I did want to ask you guys uh, or at least start floating this idea. The polling has been overestimating Trump's strengths. I wrote about that too. Overestimating Trump's strengths in a lot of these races. Not by crazy margins, but, you know, five, six points. Uh, in a points. lot of these places, eight points. Yeah. Uh, and I am just wondering if there hasn't been, you know, because when I see the polling, the head-to-head polling between Trump and Biden in Michigan, it's got him up by a few points in Michigan. I'm just so skeptical. I'm not skeptical in Nevada. I'm not skeptical in Georgia. But in Michigan, where Gretchen Whitmer just won by 10 points like a year and a half ago, 13 months ago, I don't know. It seems like a big swing. And Trump also lost in Michigan last time. Like, I just, yeah. really? Are we sure about this? It feels like the polls that maybe they've overcorrected from their shy Trump voters and we're getting some. Uh, I have a I different know. theory. I'm glad you yeah. brought this up because I've been looking at this to JVL, wrote some interesting so what you think to JVL. But um, there are two things that could be happening. Uh, you know, one of them is what I was talking about earlier that doesn't really say much about the general. It's just that pollsters are having trouble measuring the excitement of these like high info, basically libs. And they're like, come on, is this many people really going to show up, you know, to vote against Donald Trump for Nikki Haley? You know, it's kind of it's hard to model, right? Yeah. How many of these independents are going to show up? And so I do think we'll learn more about that also on Super Tuesday, you know, in the closed primary states. Well, I, I think it'll be interesting to see. Hopefully we get a couple of good polls in closed primary states so we can kind of compare. That the more optimistic potential theory is that like the Trump ballot number is kind of the number for him, and that like the people who the, there are a lot of people who are saying they're undecided or whatever that really are kind of decided that they don't like Trump, yeah, and are kind of, and are just kind of you know splashing around hoping that something better comes before November, and this is where third party becomes dangerous. Um, but that was basically what happened in twenty two. Mm-hmm. Right. In a lot of yes. these places with yes. the Cary Lakes and and, um, you know, in, in Nevada, this happened in Georgia, right? like where where Republicans were kind of getting their ballot number. And the people that were like still saying that they're undecided in October basically broke to the Democrats like Trump gets some. It's not 100 to zero. Um, but like that was an inverse of what happened in 16. Like a lot of right. a lot of what people talked about as the poll error in 16 wasn't really a poll error. It was just that. Everybody that broke in the last four days broke for tw- Trump. It was like yeah. 75, 25. Yep. And, and, and we've seen the inverse of that recently. And I do wonder if we're kind of seeing a continuation of that trend in these primary polls. Yeah. I don't know. JBL, yeah, do you have something else on that? No, I, I just think that Trump's number is going to be between 44 and 48 percent. And 48 percent is his absolute ceiling. And, uh, you know, like Biden's challenge is just consolidating the other 51 Right. I mean, that's that's 
literally the entire ball game. And I do find it hard to believe that anybody who has not broken for Trump yet does so, right? I mean, he's he's so known, he's so polarizing, he's so ever present. Like if if you're not for Trump now, you ain't ever going to be for him. Uh, all right, Joe Biden. <laughs> Focus been, group I, Sarah has some different thoughts on that, but we'll, uh, you know. Yeah, okay. We don't have to unpack that one right now, but. Well, you and I have a whole show we can do on Friday. Um, okay. He's on Seth Meyers today. He's given a speech about crime. He met with congressional leaders yesterday. He's got the State of the Union next week. On the 24th, he gave a speech to Governor's Ball. On the 23rd, a speech to the National Governors Association. On the 21st, a couple campaign speeches in San Going Francisco. The he is out there. Out there, living on the edge, talking to people, being present, doing all the things we want. So, yay? I'm Ron Burgundy. Yay-ish. Yay-ish. Um, here's the thing. So, uh, let me give him some. Let me give him some some credit for a couple things. So, number one, the Seth Meyers response on age. So, you know, Seth Meyers gave him just gave him the the softball version of the thing everybody's thinking. Uh, what about people who say you're old? And he had. Like, instead of being, like, you know, like, the way his campaign gets when people, like, do this or the way he gets cranky about it, he's kind of like, look, man, the other guy's old. He can't remember his wife's name, which is sort of not quite what happened, actually. It was, like, the Marla Maples thing. But anyway, uh, and and it, he said, you know, it's not about age. It's about old ideas. And he's got old ideas. He wants to take us backwards. And I was like, this isn't it, but we're on to something here. This is close to a thing. I feel like we're getting there. Um, I, I sort of liked that because I do think Joe Biden has a real opportunity to say, hey, look, I'm not your future, like, but I care about your future. And like, I'm the one who cares about your future. And that guy only cares about his future and only cares about running for president to get out of jail. And, you know, like, I just I think that I think they're working on something. And I think that is a much better version of what I've seen before. His execution on it was medium, and I do think... I'll take medium. Yeah, no, no, it was medium. It was medium. Medium rare or medium well? <laughs> medium, medium, medium. Medium, medium, even medium. medium. Uh, he sort of trailed off and kind of forgot what he was saying <laughs> towards the end of it. Uh, and I got to say, when he... Uh, I have a tough... When he walks in, um, I mean, he, he is just... There's a shuffling way that he walks, and I the thing that people say in the focus groups that I really lands with me because I do the same thing. You feel a human need to reach out and steady him from your living room, from wherever you're sitting, you want to take his arm. And like, I think that's, you know, uh, I think that's a tough spot for him to be in, which is why I think he should stop giving speeches. This is my, this is my big, this is my thing that I think is not good. Stop going and giving speeches. Uh, I think he needs to be out there with his arms around people, preferably so they can give him some support. Uh, to I thought you wanted podium speeches earlier. You're, give, you're giving uh, contrary takes. When did I say podium speeches? Well, you said you wanted him behind a podium if he's talking about Gaza. <laughs> well, you know, if he's going to do – so, like, I think that as a – Giving a major foreign policy, like, delivery of something new that's newsy, I think he shouldn't have an ice cream cone in his hand. Uh, that's my big thing. I think that for campaigning, like, his campaigning MO needs to be super-duper human and needs to accentuate his strengths and diminish uh, his not strengths. Diminished. <laughs> Ameliorate. Abilities. Yeah. So, like... You know, I just I would see I think a lot more shop floors, arms are like and like getting in rooms mm. with people. Great. Uh, I think red speeches are a little I, I don't know, whatever. He's going to have to give some speeches. Obviously, he has to give a statement. I like his speech. I like his stump speech. I think his okay. stump speech is quite good. Okay. Tell Talk us about, about that. What prices. do you like about the stump, st- stump yeah. speech? Hi, he's funny. You know, he, he just he hits all the notes you expect. And he talks about. Oh getting stuff done he talks about you know like we we went and we attacked insulin prices because that matters to you if you're diabetic and you're getting squeezed by pharmaceutical companies yeah he talks about the republicans trying to block the chips act and then showing up to take he's like you know take take credit for the ribbon cutting ceremonies as we're building factories it's a very it's a very very heavy kitchen table like look at look at the list of accomplishments i've done speech and 
I think that's what everybody has always said he needs to do, right? You, you can't run on the January 6th stuff. You have to run on, did you make people's lives better? And I don't know, he made people's lives better. Yeah, I um, I do think uh, nobody's watching these speeches. Um, and nobody. So right. So I do think maybe um, what could be useful. Here's my here's my campaign strategist hat for the day is, I'd like to see some like forty second TikToks. That's like one sentence of him talking about insulin, and then one sentence of Trump talking about whales. You know, one sentence of him talking mm. about Chips Act. One sentence of Trump talking about the machines, the voting machines, you know, and be like, okay, here's what, you know, one person's talking about this one, that, talking about that. So I'm sure we'll see more of that. Um, I, I thought, um, a, again, it should just be noted because we do plenty of noting around here and everywhere that, that he's, he's been, they've been hiding him too much, right? That he needs to be out yeah. there more. Everybody agrees with this. Yes. He has been out there more. So just as yeah. a statement of fact, that should be acknowledged. He's, he's out there more so far and it's good. on that front. And that's good. One week. Yes. We'll see, you know, hopefully that keeps going. I think the one to me that stood out that I think was a good contrast was having, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Moscow Maroney. No, I guess that's uh, that's Mormonism, but whatever. Mike Johnson in the in the uh, Oval Office, right? Mm-hmm. And he's negging him. I liked that. Also, we need Alpha Biden a little bit. He, you know, doesn't have to troll. You know, obviously he's not going to be Donald Trump. Doesn't have to be cruel. Doesn't have to be outside of his his brand but i like mike johnson is short you know having him in the oval office having joe Biden being like oh yeah you got that you're all over that on the budget you know just a little a couple little negs on him again it was it was, it was a b plus you know like his timing is still you know anyway it's not like barack obama delivering it but it is what it is like it's biden i think that is I, I think him the contrast between him and mike johnson is good and I think trying to alpha Mike Johnson a little bit and be like, "What's happening over there, guys?" Like, I think spending the next couple of weeks being like, "These guys are these guys are pathetic." They th- they say they got their shit together. They said they can't even fund the government. They can't do the border. They can't do Ukraine. Like, I want to do all this stuff. What are you doing over there, guys? Come on, TikTok, right? I, a little bit of that I think is good, and I, and I liked his energy in the in the Oval Office uh, meet up there with Kamala and uh, and the leadership of of both sides. So let's let's talk about the house stuff because we're yeah we're gonna do the government shutdown thing again. I'm super excited. I feel like we've seen this movie before. Uh, Joe Perticone, our boy Joe, has been all over this. Uh, his stuff is great. I feel like if I read Joe, I don't really even need to read very many other congressional reports. If you're not signed up, go go over to the Bulwark and sign up for Press Pass for Joe's newsletter. It's really so good. It's good. Um, so what do you? Sarah, where is this going and what does it matter? Are you so going to do a focus group and somebody, you know, is anybody going to say, we just Boy, did Congress. Those, those, those house people really don't have their act together. That's bad. Uh, so here's the thing. The, the more often this happens, the more it does start to stick with people a little bit. Um, but you, we did a focus group about with people on Congress and, uh, you know, they, they were the Republicans. They were much bigger fans of Mike Johnson than they ever were. Uh, of Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, because he's not a rhino. Uh, no, but I noted at the time the the dichotomy or the um, the conflicting priorities that they had, which is uh, what they really want are people to get things done, but they don't want any compromise. And so uh, the mechanism to getting things done, which is compromise, uh, you know, they don't seem to sort of recognize that. Um, I will say one of the things I went kind of, I was going deep on this to try to figure out like, okay, what is the Freedom Caucus? Like, what do they want? What do they want him to do? <laughs> and you know, they did a letter. Uh, so first of all, there's obviously the sort of cutting spending, but they also have things that they want uh, him to do as part of a deal to keep funding the government. And it was like a bunch of nutty things. Like, Reduce Mayorkas's salary to zero. <laughs> it was one of them. It was like defund Planned Parenthood. Uh, what were some of the other ones? They were like, it was really silly, ridiculous stuff. Uh, it wasn't like a serious like. Here's the thing: how we can like cut remain back. in it Mexico. Just, or, it was like you know. yeah, remain in and which. And so anyway, I just. Um, it, it 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 reading that letter from Chip Roy and some other dummy uh, reminded me of how unserious these people are. 
Yeah, I was like, um, I got a big kick out of, uh, I, I do suffer through, you really, if you're not a DC Beltway person, you really do only need to read Joe Perticone's newsletter, but you know, because I got to do content, I suffer through a punch bowl and these guys minute by minute updates and Jake Sherman and these people. And they're like, yes, or it was yesterday or Monday, they're like Mike Johnson has a new offer for Joe Biden. He's like, he wants to delay the government shutdown to March 8th. I was like, <laughs> I had to pull out my calendar. I was like, what's today? And it's like, oh, right. It was supposed to be March 2nd or something. And so he's like, oh, all right. I got a six. I'll give you six days, Uncle Joe. And it's just, they he, they have no idea what they're doing. They are lost. They're flapping around, you know, looking for it. Mike Johnson is like the, just the fundamental reality, which is unchanged, is that he can't pass anything. Doesn't really matter what his offer is. He needs Democrats to pass anything because the gates. The Roy, it, you know, it'll be a different group of people every time. Sometimes it'll be the hardline, true con, freedom caucus, you know, Tom Massey, we can't fund things group. Sometimes it'll be the mega performative, you know, Anna Paulina Luna, Bobert, right? Like, it, it'll, it's a rotating cast of crazies, kind of depending on on the issue. But like, they can't, they can't do anything. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the question is, we do have. I, like potentially their total incompetence could end up working out in favor of people that want to get things done. I have like a slight amount of optimism. I think maybe a little more than Joe. Like you look at Brian Fitzpatrick in Pennsylvania, yeah. Republican to to give him credit. Like there's a handful of people that are like, okay, guys, like I'm going to be serious about this. Like we're going to put it together a serious proposal and, and, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, use, you know, different congressional machinations to figure out a way to get this thing on the floor and to force a vote on it. I, like that might like Mike Johnson might be so weak that that, that like that, I do think that there's a door open to that actually happening because like they don't have an alternative plan like literally the alternative plan is like will you give me six more days to kind of figure out a plan <laughs> like that's our current plan. Did so, you see what's that bow tie wearing guy who was Speaker Pro Tem for like two McHenry? McKen- like they are starting to dog on Mike Johnson. Some oh, yeah. of these guys just being well, like, thing. "What well, is this guy doing?" Do they do a motion to vacate if he caves? I think the embarrassment factor. I think that, like Mike Johnson is really benefit- benefiting from the fact that like, like these guys, I just. They, they they might not have much dignity left, but they have just enough that they're like, can we really go through the humiliation of 17 more votes <laughs> for two days? I, like, I think that Mike Johnson might get to stay just because they refuse to humiliate themselves. <laughs> I can't. All right. But I don't uh, know. That's all he's got going for him, really. So in the in the Senate, so IVF talk. We Tim, we did a big, Sarah, AB, and I did a big IVF thing at uh, Principal's First over the weekend. I listened. Um, so Tammy Duckworth in the Senate has reintroduced a bill to protect IVF and Republicans are just killing it out of hand. Uh, here's Senator Roger Marshall, Republican from Kansas. I don't see any need to regulate it at the federal level. He's from Kansas. I think the, the Dobbs decision puts this issue back at the state level. And I would encourage your state legislations to protect in vitro fertilization. What is this accent? <laughs> Have you been that's, to Kansas? That's, <laughs> Have you ever been to Kansas? Topeka? That's Foghorn Wichita? Leghorn. That's literally the Foghorn Leghorn. Yeah, I know, but he's from Kansas. Foghorn Leghorn is from, like, I don't know, South Carolina Louisiana? or something. Who could, yeah. Who could say? Here's a... Here's Senator J.D. Vance, who's opposed to the bill. From Ohio. It is idiotic for us to take the bait. <laughs> that's that's his explanation. Uh, I mean, he's a little bit correct in the sense that, like, <laughs> this is... It's not idiot. I mean... Cancel, the, Sarah. No, 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 no. Hold on. It is... This is offense. Good for Tammy Duckworth. Like, good for Democrats. Go on offense. Make them vote against the IVF protection bill. Make them do it over and over again. And so, yeah, is this is this Democrats being like, hey, guys, we're going to make you defend this insanity? Uh, it is. And so it's bait a little bit, but also... Just because it's bait, J.D. Vance, doesn't mean that uh, you're not showing your true colors when you refuse to support it. Yeah, and this is just a total replay of the gay marriage thing. Yeah. Right? It's right. the same thing, basically, where the, the Republicans have given the Democrats um, 
uh, just uh, a lot of rope on an issue that divides Republicans, that's bad for Republicans politically, and it's it's a bed of their own making because it's their judges that they put that they put forth, and you know their policies that they've supported and and done. Coast, you know, this is why you don't co-sponsor a bill in the House that you think is totally hopeless, but that is a signal, you know, that that gets you on on side with the activist groups on the right. I mean, you know, and so they they've made their bet on this, um, and uh, and 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 by the way. It is bait, but this is why I liked the gay marriage play so much for the Democrats in 2022. Uh, when when the right policy and political expedience align, you're in business. Okay, yeah, that's, that's right. when you're in business. Press on the gas pedal, right? And that is true here. You know, because who knows? I don't. You know, who knows, right? Joe, like everybody, close your ears if you don't want to be triggered. Joe Biden has a stroke two days before the next election. And the Demo- and jo- and Donald Trump wins, and Democrats get fifty seven, se- or excuse me, Republicans get fifty six Senate seats because they win every contested Senate race. I, I, there's not a zero percent chance that is happening. I, I'm not predicting that, right? But so doing things that would put protections in place in the event that the Republicans have a supermajority in the Senate sometime, and that Mike Johnson is the House Speaker, and they have a six three Supreme Court, and Donald Trump is president, who the fuck knows what they would do? I, um, so I, I don't, I don't really think that like I that it's an acute threat. Like I didn't think that overturning gay marriage was a really acute threat, but it's a possible threat. And so why not do the right thing, protect it, take the political advantage, and and move forward. So yeah, I think that Doc was doing the right thing on this. All right, last item: Tyler Bobert. Young Tyler Bobert, 22-year-old, whose mom is a just a super liberated grandma who likes to get handsy at off-Broadway productions and national traveling shows. Uh, he was unfortunately arrested for stuff. 22 counts seems like perhaps, allegedly, he's connected to a string of car thefts and burglaries. And I, Tim... You you are the soul of compassion. I am poor. I just I didn't like that I heard Tyler Bobert was in the rundown. You know, he's twenty two. He's going through some things, figuring mm. shit out. Probably shouldn't have. Probably shouldn't have robbed any cars. You know, probably shouldn't have done that. Uh, we don't probably. know. Probably. He definitely shouldn't have done. Yeah, that. definitely shouldn't yeah. have. Definitely shouldn't have. Do you see the? Do you see the tweet that was going around by like the? Far lefty guy. Oh that yeah, was like, that we was can't like, hijack planes. <laughs> like, we can't protest. He was complaining that 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 pro the Gaza protesters get criticized no matter what they do. But it was maybe not the best way to express that point because he was like, we can't protest, we can't shut down highways, we can't hunger strike, we can't hijack planes, <laughs> we, we can't, can't set ourselves on fire, we can't self immolate. It's like what? No, yeah, yeah, no, you can't. Wait, the first two Don't things were okay, things. actually. The first two things were okay. <laughs> Hunger strike was fine. Yeah, like uh, that was okay. If you want to do that, um, that's that's up to you. But no, you can't. Uh, you shouldn't self immolate. Um, so definitely shouldn't hijack. Planes. Definitely shouldn't self immolate. You definitely shouldn't hijack plane. You definitely shouldn't rob cars. Uh, but. Yeah, I don't. We do. We don't. We don't need to go dunking on. We don't need to have our own Hunter Biden over here. We don't need to dunk on a twenty-two-year-old who's mate, who is, you know, whose mom is in the spotlight. Who never should have been in the spotlight, by the way. You know, she owned a, a restaurant in Rifle, Colorado, that like bikers uh, frequented, and so he wasn't supposed to be in the news, you know. And so, uh, and so he's kind of dealing with things, maturing. And I don't, I don't know why you want to pick on these people so badly, JVL. I think it's rude. I'm Sarah, sensitive to young men Tim who right. are dealing with their. Of course, Tim is right. Maturity. His kid had to be raised by Lauren Boebert. Like he's yeah. been punished enough. I don't Seriously. think we have to pile on with. I I I like the leaving families out of politics uh, as a rule. It feels like as a as a we used to kind of have that, and we don't anymore. And uh, you know, I'm sad about that. Now, to be fair, when you uh, install your kids in the White House and then let them like run your foreign policy and. Yeah, Jared Kushner isn't salaries. counted here. Yeah. You know, uh, he's that, not a 22 year old with a wispy mustache trying right. to create a little trouble on the Western Slope. All right. Well, I have a deeply personal argument against all of that, but <laughs> okay. I will save that for another. <laughs> no, time. I want to hear it. I will. You know, I, uh, so I went to Quaker school, Quaker school through sixth grade, and the Quakers 
had basically only two punishments if you acted out in school. And the first one was called the Red Bench. And the Red Bench was a bench that was the color red that sat in, like, the middle of the central stairwell in school. And if you were bad, you were sent to the Red Bench. And it would basically, it's basically like being in the stocks. Because, every you know, all the other kids would come by you, heading to and from class, and be like, Oh, Mike, did you see Mike was in the Red Bench? Mike was at the Red Bench. Terrible. And I was sent to the Red Bench once. And I, it was, I was in second grade, and I was utterly terrified that that thing was going on my permanent record. I did not tell my parents until I was in my mid-twenties that I had been to the Red Bench. And it marked me for the entire rest of my life. I, you know, I I don't think I ever got detention, ever, once I hit, like, real school where they did things like give detentions. I never touched any of the marijuana because I thought, I can't do that. If I do that, I'll get caught. And I'll go to jail, and it'll go on my permanent record. And you never, never casually took something out of an unlocked car just to kind of be never a... Never had a... You never, did that, all my friends, When all I, my friends I don't were know. Having, I just, I've, I've heard about people that did that. that you know, all my friends who got that fake IDs bad. were like, come on, come on, JVL. We're going to get fake IDs. I said, you can't do that. If you get caught with a fake ID, that's against the law. And it could go on your permanent record and you won't get into medical this school. This will be on Tyler Bober's permanent record. I don't understand why you're upset. You're, you were right. This, is, this will be, I'm pretty sure that the thefts will be on his permanent record. And national podcasters talk about it. It's... I'm just saying everybody in life should go through with a, a paralyzing fear of things going on their permanent records. I don't. Just that. like I did. I don't believe. Okay. I don't think that that's right. <laughs> uh, I'd just like and... to state for the record that somewhere between JBL's like insane notion of justice for 12 year olds or whatever uh, and Tim's. Just stealing stuff from people's cars. <laughs> I didn't people... say I stole anything. I'm just saying that Check That Jetta was a game I had heard about in Boulder. Check That's all I'm saying. Check That Jetta? <laughs> a lot of people didn't lock their Jettas. I don't know what the overlap was on that, but I did. Okay. I didn't well, hear between about these two miscreants, there's somebody like me who, you know, did the stuff that teenagers do while not doing things that harmed other people actively, like stealing from them or whatnot. Fair. Speaking of which, we can I have a final point on this and actual yeah. seriousness? Hunter sure. Biden is testifying today. Oh. Okay. So unlike T- T- Tyler, who's you know going to deal with the local authorities in, in Colorado, um, the the House Republicans. This was uh, something that uh, that Matt Iglesias was on the uh, flagship with me the other day. Um, said, uh, had, had analyzed, 70 hours they've done. 70 mm. hours of hearings about Hunter Biden. We had a nice seven-minute chat here about Tyler. Uh, 70 hours. And now he's going in front of them today. And I do think that, um, you know, maybe, again, tying back to the Tammy Duckworth thing, tying back to the Joe Biden, be on offense on this. The Democrats should be on offense about this. This is absurd. Like, we've reached the point of absurdity. And yeah. if, if, if we're going to be going past 70 hours of Hunter Biden and, and the only piece of actual evidence you thought you had about his dad turned out to be Russian disinformation. So yeah. it's, let's, by a guy let's, who's like probably going to jail for lying. Yeah. Mm. Like, you should talk about that, guys. All right. Good show. Long show. I Everybody go check long. out. It was very long. Or at least it felt long. Go you check yawned out. once. I saw <laughs> you <laughs> yawn. I saw him yawn. I saw him fighting that yawn a bunch of times. Go check out the flagship pod with Tim Miller, who's on loan to us on Wednesdays. It is absolutely fantastic. It's great. Come sign up for my newsletter. Come see Sarah Longwell's great pieces in the Atlantic Monthly. And, uh, and we'll catch you again next week.